and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, a, a archaeologist and historian by profession, and a man who has spent, who has spent, spent more time de delving into books and tomes than I have, and that's saying <laughs> something, and creator of the upcoming epic fantasy role-playing system called For Honor and For Glory, not to be confused with the Ubisoft game, because fuck Ubisoft. Right. <laughs> the one and only Orion Scott Krolek. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, you know, I, I suppose... It, it would be it would be funny as hell if your zodiac sign was a Sagittarius. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, I'm an Aries, but. <laughs> um, so where to begin? Well, oh, I usually start at the humble beginnings, the origin story. So, walk me through your f first introduction to role playing games and what was it that made it stick? Uh, personally. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been playing um, role playing games, particularly. Uh, old school, you know, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons since I was like eight and I'm 40 now. So it's been a minute. Um, and then, uh, you know, through the years, um, my best friend and the, the, the co-creator of the game, um, Jason Young, he and I uh, started experimenting with other games. Like we played uh, the, the World of Darkness games when they came out, Shadowrun and uh, just whatever hit the table, uh, Rifts. Uh, my and, uh, <laughs> right. But uh, we always had a, a, a deep love for um, epic fantasy role-playing um, and medieval role-playing. Um, I grew up in a uh, society for the creative anachronisms household. And, oh, and you to, too, uh, huh? Yeah, yeah. Went to tourneys as a young Dane and, you know, uh, my dad was a fighter and, you know, my mom uh, was often, she's a nurse and uh, was a nurse and uh, she'd often be on medical staff and things. And uh, so... You know, playing D and D um, all those years, uh, I kind of I, I loved the the, the genre, but uh, especially as we got older and wanted a kind of a different flavor of game, uh, Jason and I got really just kind of um, tired of the same old system and you know various editions, you know, all the way to fifth now. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying there are. It, it, I'm not knocking D and D at all. It's just uh, it doesn't lend itself to certain styles of storytelling. Oh, I'll knock it because because <laughs> you're t you're t you're touching on thing you're touching on the thing that was that I that I had dipped into in a vi in a video I put up last night. Oh, um, I put up a musing. I put up a seven minute musing called the role playing bubble because one of one of the people on my Discord, um, Petals, who got no beef with him, but he kind of started this. <laughs> Kick the hornet's nest, as it were. Um, he had brought he had brought up the notion of fifth edition being a good introduction to role playing games, and I had I had basically said D and D that um this idea this idea that D and D of any edition is a good introduction to um, role playing I find fallacious. Yeah, it is. It, it's it's become so meta. Well. <sighs> There's the there's the f first off there's the f there's the fact that despite what some people want to argue with me on, um, D and D has a shit or get off the pot attitude when it comes to what style of fantasy it's supposed to be. Yes, definitely. Now a lot of that is a consequence of the of um, Gygax and Arson just throwing a bunch of things in a pot that they happen to like back in the seventies, but. There, but the but um, I think but it's very telling when I when I ask on social media or I ask on forums what style of fantasy D and D is, and I get a bunch of different responses. Some people say high fantasy, some people say epic fantasy, some people say sword and sorcery, and the answer, and the problem is, all you can't you can't sit you can't say that it's all of them at once, um. Like right. j consider the, consider the four consider the names that were the inspiration, um, Gygax, not 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 Gygax. What am I talking about? Tolkien, Moorcock, Howard, Vance, and Lieber. 
What mm -hmm. are the wor besides being fantasy? There's not a whole lot that the besides being fantasy authors, there's not a whole lot that any of them have in common. Right. Uh, but the, the the point is with Front Up for Glory is I wanted to give um, you know a return to a lot of those roots, uh, some of the, the the fiction that inspired. Um, early fantasy and also with uh, uh, returning to the actual historical documents, some of the, 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 the Norse sagas, the, the uh, you know, chronicles of in, in England, uh, return to some of that source material and write a game that was really like a return to all the things that Tolkien was reading, that, you know, Howard was reading that, that inspired them to kind of make that first uh, wave of modern fantasy. Um, that so much has been derived from since. Um, if you hear what I'm saying, mm -hmm. uh, that was the real push as uh, to, to take it back to uh, some of its historical roots and um, one try to create a combat system that uh, with the whole game focused on storytelling, but one create a combat system that really um, more accurately portrays um, actual medieval combat. You know, being that kid growing up watching the SCA fighters, um, being an archer, um, knowing how some of these things work in reality and then watching how it plays out on the gaming table with games like D&D &D. Mm -hmm. and just being, at the end of the day, just generally dissatisfied. Mm -hmm. So uh, one night, Jason and I sat down after playing D&D uh, &D into the wee hours with some friends and uh, we were you know, kicking back some beers and uh, decided, you know, hey, let's fix it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. let's let's do this differently and and write a different um kind of game that's not just another you know recycled d20 um kind of system and and uh you know play style but let's do something let, let's redo modern fantasy the mm -hmm. way we think it should work yeah um and having played a lot of of uh games over the years other games um aside from D, &D um we knew kind of a lot of what was out there, what we liked, what we didn't like, what uh, worked really nicely for modeling things uh, as far as get, uh, game mechanic and statistics, mm -hmm. but you know, really didn't play quickly, and so it bogged things down. And um, like, if, did you ever play Shadowrun? Uh, I think the second or third edition. I have, I have played. I've played second edition was my introduction. Third edition is the is in the realm of we don't talk about that. <laughs> right. Um, fourth edition. I, fourth edition. I I enjoy, I enjoyed um, fifth edition. I I, al I also enjoyed, and I, especially when they brought in the priority system, which made um, mm -hmm. character creation a heck of a lot easier for for me to handle quickly. And um, sixth edition, I know a lot of people give sixth edition some shit, but I do, but um, I don't mind it. I think I I think I think a lot of people aren't willing to accept the fact that the the skill list for Shadowrun needed to get pared down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Get a little out of hand. Uh, but so, we, you know, we having played those games, mm -hmm. um, Shadowrun 2nd Edition particularly, we liked the, the opposed roles, the, the, the scaled damage, and, you know, mm -hmm. um, those aspects. And we're like, you know, that's kind of the way things should work, even for um, a, a fantasy, you know, or medieval role-playing game. Uh, I mean, you should be able to ride by an opponent and if you've got the tactical upper hand and you know you're you're charging on the horseback and you charge by with your sword you should be able to you know pretty much take your foe out uh with one blow if you have any skill <laughs> to back it up yeah um at the same time we didn't want to make a system that was so deadly that players would just fall out left and right uh so um well, I'm, I'm getting a little off topic but uh, where, where where should we focus here? There's a lot to talk about here. <laughs> well, <clears throat> now, I, I suppose I suppose if you don't mind, I'd like to play a bit of a lightning round because I'm no stranger to fantasy games that tr that try and that try and aim for some degree some degree of greater realism or greater verisimilitude mm -hmm. um, com compared to the bigger names out there. So I'd like to give a few names, and you can tell me if you're familiar with it, or some of your t or your takes on some of its mechanics. Okay. Um, chivalry and sorcery. Haven't played it. Okay. It's certainly on the crunchy end of things. 
Although most of that crunchiness is front loaded into character creation. It's it was one of those started as a D and D hack and then got out of hand kind of things. Gotcha. Um Rollmaster or Merp. I have played Merp. Uh, yeah. a little bit, not a lot. Now Merp is basically a simplified quote unquote, with the biggest finger quotes possible version of Rollmaster. Mm-hmm. Um I liked it, but it but um it ha it has Rollmaster was one of, was another one of those started out as a D and D hack and then went out of then got out of hand. Um, gotcha, yeah. And it has it has one thing that's a bit of a bad habit of a lot of early D and D and a lot of early role playing games. Period. That is a lack of a a lack of a unified system. Right. Yeah. You have a bu- you have a bunch a of sub- You have a bunch of subsystems, which was. Fairly co- fairly common in a lot of war games, especially during that war game boom in the seventies. Yeah. So it's and since D and D was based on chainmail, it kind of carried over. Well, on the point of a unified system, we we do have a unified mechanic. Um, while we're on the the topic of a, of a unified mechanic, um, yeah. everything is done based on uh, multiple D twenty rolls. We, all we use is D twenties. Um, kind, kind of like Omni or True 20? Yes, um, but with a difference. Um, say you want to make a, a basic weapon attack. Um, so you'd say with a longsword. I'll just mm-hmm. say, go with a very generic example. You're going to roll a number of dice, a number of D20s, equal to your strength score. And you're going to look at your... You're using a martial weapon. You're going to look at your martial weapon skill. Uh, and you're going to roll... Say you've got a a, a mortal character, mm-hmm. a player character has a stat of one to five. One being a human average, uh, a zero meaning that you just get a ten because you don't have any dice. Um, being below human average, five being maximum human av- average. Mm-hmm. You roll a number of dice for your strength score equal to whatever your attribute is. Let's say it's two, um, and then you get your uh, skill as the bonus. Now, your opponent is going to decide, okay, well, am I going to try to take the blow or am I going to try to, you know, dodge or, you know, how are they going to defend against the attack, assuming that they're aware of the attack, right? Mm -hmm. And they're going to roll a number of dice equal to either their vitality, if they're just going to try to soak it, or their finesse uh, to roll out of the way. Now, they're going to add their defense bonus, just like Mm -hmm. you added your skill. Mm-hmm. And it's the difference between those two results that determines the 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 uh, uh, level of success. Mm-hmm. So, say your your fighter guy swinging the sword rolled, and he's got say a seventeen for his his best of his three dice, mm-hmm. um, and he's adding on his skill and any bonuses that may apply for higher ground or or what have you. Mm-hmm. Uh, talents, which uh, works similarly to uh, third edition D anD. d uh, feats, but uh, roughly only. Well, I'll get to I'll get to that in a minute. I'll have some things to say on that. Okay, uh, but the difference, say he rolls a seventeen, he has a bonus of plus six, so that gives him a twenty-three. The other guy rolls his finesse. Say he's only got a twenty. Well, uh, one success, one one higher on the attack means that you've minimally succeeded. Uh, one box on your damage chart. Mm-hmm. Um, if he'd gotten five over, that'd be two boxes. So he scored a hit, but a minimal hit. Every mm-hmm. character that's living has a damage chart um, of ten boxes. And um, if you'll remember in Second Ed Shadow Run, a uh, very kind of similar concept. Um, as you get more damaged uh, cumulatively, mm-hmm. uh, you're going to start taking penalties. Uh, now we've staged them differently because we wanted more like of a heroic action um, and didn't want characters to wear down as quickly mm-hmm. uh, with their their roll penalties. But whether your uh, point is is whether you're making attack, casting a spell, um, performing a skill check, um, it all uses that multiple d20 system. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're trying to do say a medicine skill to you know heal um, one of your party members. Um, uh, who's been poisoned mm-hmm. and try to, you know, save them from the poison uh, and, and, and uh, get it out of their system uh, with herbs or what have you. Okay, cool. Um, in that case, you're going to make a roll against a static DC that's set by the Chronicler. 
uh, mm-hmm. the person who runs who's running the game, mm-hmm. and uh, that's going to determine um, whether you're you know minimally successful or greatly successful, depending on how skilled you are, uh, what tools you have at hand, etc. That modify mm-hmm. your role. But everything is done. Point is, is everything is done with that multiple D twenty system. Mm-hmm. So continuing uh, on. So continuing on from the lightning round. Um, Riddle of Steel. I haven't played that one, but I've seen it. It looks interesting. Yeah, I um, I didn't cover. I haven't covered it specifically, but I have covered two games that were kind of its successors. Um, that being um, Song of Swords and Blade of the Iron Throne. Mm-hmm. So, I haven't seen those. <laughs> um, and part of this. Mm-hmm. I'll have to admit, I've been in a bubble for about the last four years while I've been uh, dealing with life in the consulting firm and writing these books <laughs> and uh, play testing them and all else. Yeah, I can I can understand that. Um, Ars Magica. Yes, I've played Ars Magica. Mm-hmm. That was a great game. Yeah. It's a great game. Um, it's magic system is going to be a rabbit hole, which I, if I were to try and if I were to try and explain that explain that for the audience, I'm not coming back. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, it's a little complicated. Uh, but let's see, I, know, I feel like th- I feel like there's one. I feel like there's one that I'm that I'm missing but I'm pr- I'm pretty sure I'll fi- I'm pretty sure I'll figure it out la- I'll figure it out later. But well oh, go, on the go ahead. on the point of a magic system um you know I, I, I said earlier that uh, we wanted for honor for glory to be you know a very collective storytelling kind of game uh, mm-hmm. experience. So um we were looking at a lot of the, the myths and legends uh, and fantasy novels and things like that that we love and how uh, what, what, what the role of magic is. Um, and instead of going with, you know, kind of a template approach uh, where, you know, you have a fireball and it has, you know, blah, 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 blah. Uh, we wanted to kind of mix things up a little bit and um, change the, the nature of magic um, as it plays out in ta- the table. I'm not saying you can't throw a fireball, but, uh, mm-hmm. you know, you have the ability um, to be much more creative um, with a bit of a, an open-ended um, magic system. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've got, uh, I think, five basic types of magic, if I remember correctly, if I'm, if I'm counting them all. Um, yes, we break everything down into uh, the dimensional discipline, elemental discipline, planar discipline, primal discipline, mental discipline, mm-hmm. um, to cover everything from, you know, uh, psionics to priest types in the D and D idiom, um, to summoners and, uh, you know, elementalists, uh, people who've been space and time, um, whatever your flavor is, you can pretty much, we've, we've not yet really come up with a flavor that doesn't kind of fit in there somewhere. Um, uh, like for instance, we're about to start play testing, uh, for, uh, the age of sales and, uh, my fiance, Allison Edison, who's, sitting here listening to us behind me uh, <laughs> is about to uh, start playing a uh, voodoo priestess mm-hmm. uh, in a, a uh, kind of Pirates of the Caribbean flavored game set in, in uh, the Caribbean in uh, 1715, mm-hmm. uh, just at the close of the Second War of, of, of Spanish Succession. Uh, and so far, like, we haven't played this character yet, but so far I'm looking at it going, after she built it, I'm going, oh, man, this is going to be so sweet. This is yeah. this is like role-playing gold here. Um, where, she, you know, she's going to be summoning the, the Loa and, and mm-hmm. uh, doing a lot of uh, ritual magic. But uh, back to the point of the magic system, within those five disciplines, um, you've got basically two things you as a caster have to decide. What area of effect... Um, you want the spell to to uh, utilize Mm -hmm. and what the effect is Um, you describe what you want the to the chronicler what you're trying to do with say you know your mental manipulation to to Mm -hmm. bend people's thoughts or you know uh, implant a suggestion or whatever and those two things come together to give you a total power score Mm -hmm. Um, you can over you have an attribute that's your your magical power with a capital p Mm -hmm. 
uh, you can cast over that, but there's a chance um, that you will you damage your connection to the mystic, mm -hmm. uh, whatever flavor it may be. Um, and you can burn yourself out eventually. Uh, there's also a chance uh, when you overcast that and do things beyond your ability and your skill level that uh, you're going to take on uh, magical weirdness. Um, mm -hmm. So say, you know, a, a air elementalist, uh, their skin might take on a blue tinge mm -hmm. um, or turn white and kind of flowy, you know, something that's that's supernatural looking and inhuman, which when you've got, uh, you know, holy orders running around that are, are uh, at the behest of the church that are actively <laughs> quashing magic users mm -hmm. uh, in the medieval setting, uh, that's that's a problem, <laughs> you know. Uh, they only want kind of one story to be told, and that's that's the 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 the, the story of their religious backdrop. Mm -hmm. And so everything else they're kind of trying to push out um, for political reasons, um, mm -hmm. and that's a very familiar story in history. Right. Um, but you know, then you roll your wisdom like you would any other uh, check for that spell to see the outcome and of course if it's directed at a unwilling opponent um it's going to be opposed just like an attack or anything else with varying degrees of success um it sounds more complicated than it is people who played uh, magic users uh, in for honor for glory and play test um it took them about two or three spells to wrap their head around like wait i can do that and then <laughs> they ran with it and uh you get some really interesting things like uh for instance, uh, there was a battle in a Norse game that we were playtesting, and uh, there's a, a Dolkofar, a, a dark elf, who's a, a dimensional caster. Mm -hmm. And uh, riding down on this character is a uh, a guy on horseback with a you know sword held high, getting ready to just come in and, and you know charge him from horseback uh, on the back lines of the battlefield. And the wizard just uh, the Dolkofar wizard just turns to the side, casts a, a fairly uh, simple uh, but clever dimensional spell and makes the horse disappear from where it was at the moment and reappear um, about, you know, I think it was six feet above the guy's head in mid mid ride. Mm -hmm. So suddenly the rider has, you know, a horse crashing down on top of him in addition to falling off a horse. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was a bad day for him. Um, but the point is, is, you know, that, uh, the open-ended magic system really allows a, a large degree of creativity um, in the way that players can contribute to the story. And they're not stuck in um, like pre-made templates and uh, bounded by, you know, these are the only spells I have in my spell book or that sort of concept. Yeah. I, um, I have, I have been, I have not been shy of how critical I am of the, of the Vancian, of the um, Vancian model as it as it's been applied to D and D, and so whenever I bring this kind of thing up, people say, "Oh, you you just don't like it in you just don't like it in fifth edition." No, I had this I had this problem when I was still using the old black books. Yeah, because my fir my first D and D was um, the black book versions of a D and D second edition. Mm hmm. Um, Same here. And the the idea the idea. Of, Given how, given how, given how, um, given how spellcasting is 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 described as working, the idea of the idea of having to memorize the memorize the spells and ne and needing them all in a book and having to do rests in order to in order to be able to cast again didn't make sense when so when when so much of the world is trying to go for this magic and the supernatural is is everywhere in some form. Exactly. Uh, I felt the exact same way <laughs> and oh. have for years. Uh, now, that being said, aside from overcasting um, in For Honor for Glory when you mm -hmm. cast a spell, um, if you're kind of pushing the limits, um, but the final thing you do after you cast a spell is, uh, especially if it's over your, your power, is you have to make a check to see if you've lost a stun point. Because mm -hmm. um, each character has a pool of stun points. Um, similar to, you know, I guess, uh, subdual hit points or, or any number of other Mm -hmm. you know uh uh same kind of concept yeah, but stun. basically when you run out of stun points you get knocked out mm -hmm. you pass out uh, knocked unconscious whatever uh you know fighters lose them when they take hard hits mm -hmm. um 
the uh, magic users, however, um, might, you know, at the, after casting a, a spell, especially if it's over their power, they have to make a, a quick roll. And do you hit the target number for that spell that you just, you just threw out there? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, you failed that check. Well, you lose a stun point. And when you've only got uh, two plus whatever your vitality score is, one to five, and the casters don't tend to have a huge vitality, mm-hmm. well, that's that could be a problem if you've only got four of them. Um, you want to try to do, if you're going to cast a lot, you want to try to do smaller effects mm-hmm. and uh, conserve your energy. Um, for that reason, we've noticed a lot of playtesters who play magical characters often pick up a, a sword or, or some other means to defend themselves other than just their magic. I mean, uh, after all, you know, at Helm's Deep there, Gandalf's got uh, his staff and his sword, and he's swinging that way more than he's, he's throwing lightning bolts at his eyes and fireballs at his arse, right? Yeah, which it which is kind of amusing because there's the there's there's the stereotype in the in the zeitgeist that the that in order to balance things out, um, quote unquote, the cast the caster is supposed to be more squishy, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. Um, no, the as long as there's a give and take, I feel that balances the system. You're just forcing people into stereotypes. You know? I've I've felt for the longest time that the balance between cast between casters and non casters in something like D and D, and I I don't mean I don't mean to keep ragging on that one specifically, but these but because of the <laughs> fact that it's hard people, for me to do too. <laughs> well, because of the fact that pe- that people think that people think that that's the that it's the way to do it, and end up overlooking some of these problems. I feel it's my duty to br- to bring them up, and. If any game is going to call itself the world's greatest role-playing game, I think I'm, I think I'm morally obligated to take it down da- to take it down a peg, and remind right. you you're not you're not the you're not the greatest because you're not the greatest because you, because um you're not Muhammad Ali, right? <laughs> um, but the there has been there has been a ske- there has been a skewing in the fa- in favor of casters for the longest time. You've probably heard the phrase. Linear warriors, quadratic wizards. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, whether whether it be through way way too many spells, I think in AD and D there was a letter by letter spell encyclopedia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, or the or the fa- or the fact that the options that non casters have is limited. Which is which is why I always find it funny that so many that so many people screamed bloody murder in the 2000s when the tome, when um, Tome of Battle came out and had the audacity to give fighters something else to do. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, because and I've always been a big fan of fighters, and I mean that's that's what the majority of the people on the field are going to be. Yeah. Um, especially in a uh, if you if you have a historical setting, uh, because Front for Glory takes place on Earth in mm-hmm. in history. But you've probably, um, some of the counter seen, earth where everything comes to life, but you've probably seen the issue of um, fu- of martial characters in general and fighters, especially being treated as Babby's first class. Yeah, because and... all you're doing is ba- all you're doing is basic attack. I know I know some try and spice it up by through things like through things like power attack or preci- or precision attack or the like. But the fact of the matter is, it's still just a modified version of basic attack. And the selling point of the fighter being able to utilize any kind of weapon isn't re- doesn't really connect when people are going to stick with one, with one equipment setup for at least at least yeah, for most for, encounters, if not for their entire adventuring career. Their flavor, exactly. Um, on that point, you know, we've been talking about wizards and fighters and mm-hmm. kind of in the idiom of D and D classes a lot, and. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, at this point, it, it's a good point to point out that For Honor, For Glory does not use classes. We have a build point system in mm-hmm. which you kind of build your own custom character. Uh, every you know character is a unique mm-hmm. um, entity, um, particularly when you take their um, status uh, within society, their profession, all the things that really tell you uh, who a historical figure is mm-hmm. in context and, and build that into character creation. Mm-hmm. Um, so for instance, um, when you make a character in front of her glory, uh, the base build is 60 build points and, uh, you choose a race, uh, 
the vast majority of characters who come to the table because um, we don't have that many races. There's Alfar elves, Dokulfar um, in the the North Sidium, mm-hmm. uh, the She, um, the you know fairy folk of of uh, Irish uh, and and uh, Celtic myth and legend. Uh, We've got one that's thrown in that's probably the wazziest of them all, and uh, that's uh, troll bloods, which are mm-hmm. you know kind of troll human hybrids. But um, the thing about playing those other races is they each have their own neat little twists that could be very cool for story. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're very limited because, um, as we all know or quite aware, elves didn't. Uh, even if in stories where they do exist, elves, dark elves, these these extra you know supernatural kind of entities, um, never had a place in mortal society. Um, it's very rare that they do. Um, so, humans are kind of the the rule, <laughs> which a lot of people look at that and go, "Oh man, I hate this. I always want to play a tabaxi or you know one of the the you insane have no races." Idea that have... how many t- <laughs> there have been several times where where um I'm where I say I where I say you guys are playing <clears throat> you guys are doing you you guys are doing human only race race wise and somebody yeah. and somebody says but I I want to be I want to be a tiefling and I say this is not a discussion <laughs> <laughs> this is this is for this game that's the rule mm-hmm. um but yeah so. Humans also have the extra little buff that they receive 15 extra build points of character creation. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this is your, your quote unquote starting character. Mm-hmm. Um, somebody who's not, uh, who's on the cusp, who's just become a uh, capital H heroic character. Yeah. Um, so after you choose your race, that doesn't cost you any build points. But again, human gives you an extra 15. Mm-hmm. Uh, you very much kind of a la carte by your. Um, attribute stats and your skills, mm-hmm. your talents um, to uh, your magical power, etc. Mm-hmm. Uh, even your your status and wealth. Um, that brings me to another point. Um, aside from the, the basic mechanical stuff of skills and attributes and all that, we have a background traits and flaws system, uh, mm-hmm. which a, a lot of games have used something very similar. Uh, the White Wolf games, for instance. Oh, yeah. Where, you know, you take... Um, some flaws and they'll give you some extra build points at character creation. Um, Mm -hmm. If you're, you know, say playing a a child character or somebody who's uh, been cursed in some way, or, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, having, um, let's see, what's some good examples here. I'll scroll down to flaws. Uh, An apostate who uh, is, is is outside of the graces and protections of the church, but practices magic uh, forbidden and heretical uh, kind of act there, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, you have a compulsion, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You have, you know, enemies out there. You're elderly. Yeah. Just whatever. throwing this out there, would you have an equivalent to someone who is an oathbreaker? Uh, yeah, actually. That, that rings a bell. Where would I have that? Yeah. I know that term is used for something specific in some, in some novels. I'm, I'm more referring to, say, Say a say a knight or a, or a soldier who was who was pledged to service, but and but ended up um, deserting or so, or something like that. I think we've actually used that as an example under the uh, infamy flaw. Um, you're known for for being a a uh, oath breaker, mm-hmm. and it has created a stigma on your name. Um, and, exactly, and uh, on the you can you can take up to um, ten points of flaws. Mm-hmm to give you a few extra build points. And then on the flip side, there's um, background traits that can help define like who you are within society. Um, mm-hmm. Are you a, you know, acolyte of a, a holy order? Uh, do you have armsmen at your beck and call? Are you a noble, an artisan? Mm-hmm. Um, are you of a celestial heritage? Uh, are you a changeling that uh, is, uh, this is one for the she characters that was, you know, secretly uh, switched with a human baby when it was born mm-hmm. um so you you look human and you know you're actually a she a, you're a fairy but uh you know you've been uh, you've grown up uh maybe not even knowing what you are but mm-hmm. uh you know uh you know do you have contacts um you know special contacts that can give you uh potential information or, or resources uh, mm-hmm. entertainer farmer whatever yeah uh in the chronicler's guide if a chronicler chooses to allow them there's even uh, background traits like uh, being in a royal line or uh, 
demigod mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that give you special abilities. Um, almost all of them give you, you know, some sort of little perk or or benefit. Mm -hmm. um, bonuses to skills um, depending on the situation and they have variable point costs depending on on um, what you're what you're taking mm -hmm. um, but I love the, the this this kind of system because and you can buy as many background traits as you want to spend points on of course we limited the flaws because then you end up with everybody being you know a, a hunchbacked uh, diseased leper who you know it gets out of hand uh, for the min maxers at the table oh yeah we've I've <clears throat> I've de I've dealt I would say I've dealt with munchkins, but at my height, um, most people could be, could be considered munchkins. <laughs> right. Um, Everybody's looking for that edge, though. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I I'm fully aware, and I can't I can't I can't um, be too harsh on it simply because um, there's been there's been times where I've done things like um, like palerers in in games, <laughs> you know, sorcerer paladin hybrids, and yeah. my DM absolutely hated it. <laughs> or um there was there was a time I, there was a time I did a uh martial artist build who was who was based entirely on wrestling and because we were going with more um epic fantasy in the as in um the kind of, the kind of epic fantasy that you'd that you'd see in a Gre Greco-Roman epic um, yeah there was there was nothing he couldn't wrestle up to and including and even going beyond bears nice why? Because I want because I wanted I wanted for him to be able to wrestle a bear, and also, at the time at also while I was writing the while I was writing up the character, I was watching Lou Ferrigno Hercules, ah. where he thro <laughs> where he throws a bear into space. Yes, <laughs> it, it that movie is terrible, but it is great riffing material because they had to be. I'd I'd say they had to be on drugs, but then I remembered Zardoz exists. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which is, I still have no idea how how to how to summarize that movie, but since you're since you're going with point based, that brings me to one question I f I feel obligated to ask. Go for it. A common pitfall that happens with point based games, both in both in the past and to a certain degree nowadays, is analysis paralysis. Because you have this limited um, that you have you when you have that level of free form, it can it can be in, it can be intimidating. You can have people worried about whether or not a allocation into into certain aspects is going to screw them over two or three sessions down the road. Gotcha. So um, how how do you how do you mitigate that? This is also why I brought up the whole priority thing that Shadowrun um, Fifth Edition did. Yeah. Um, well. We kind of leave it to the players. Um, but that being said, the very first thing in the Chronicler's Guide that it, it uh, recommends a Chronicler do when they're going to start a story is to sit down and everybody makes their character together. Mm -hmm. um, doing that, I mean, a lot of uh, gaming groups will just, you know, if they're, especially if they're playing like Pathfinder or D&D or, or, you know, something along those lines, mm -hmm. they'll just say, okay, well, what level? Okay, cool. And they just jam out a character. But uh, we made, I really wrote it a point to, to uh, encourage chroniclers to sit down and uh, your very first session, spend the first you know, 20 minutes making your characters, creating their backstory, creating, you know, using the flaws um, and background traits to help frame their, you know, who their character is in society, mm -hmm. um, as well as wealth. Wealth is the other thing I didn't mention, um, mm -hmm. which gives you things like retainers or, or lands and holdings. Um, but the point is, is that you kind of most groups, especially if especially if they've ever played any role playing game before, kind of understand that there's there's like sticks that you need in each party if you're going to be successful. You know, you need your you get your, you've got your party dynamic, so to speak. The golden you know, triangle. Your, yeah, exactly. Um, where everybody kind of has their role, mm -hmm. and sitting down and creating those characters together um, also introduces the chronicler to who each character is in, in context of society uh, and not just what they can do, but you kind of, that's, that's often when I'm DMing, a, or I'm, I'm chronicling a story, mm -hmm. uh, I'm running a game. Um, I sit down and like, that's where I really start to, to figure out where to hook characters into stories. Um, I've also allowed characters uh, or players rather um, during downtime, 
to um, if you know if they've bought something and they're like, uh, I don't know, I don't like this this you know build point. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll let them honestly, um, you know, redact um, build points and and take away like say, okay, well this talent kind of sucks, and of course we've been you know um, uh, play testing, so some things needed to be tweaked anyway. Mm-hmm. But uh, especially early on, it's like okay, well. Yeah, if you want to slide those build points over to something else and lose that, that's okay. Um, I never do it during active, you know, play when the story is really doing things, but um, because of the 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 way that stories end up playing out, where uh, just like in in epics and things, you know, you might have your group of characters who are from a given town or you know uh, whatever whatever ties them together. Um, they'll go out and they'll you know, go on campaign or whatever for a year, maybe two, and then they'll come back. And um, they may have six months, a year, two years mm-hmm. where they're tending their, their, uh, their farms, they're, yeah. they're being the noble, they're, you know, um, kind of doing the, the maintenance. And mm-hmm. in game, you storyboard that uh, quite a bit, you know. Um, but you have these pauses, but you have to really, uh, because one, that's the way real life kind of works yeah. before the next things develop. But um, also too, that kind of allows that, you know, a pause and, you know, the character the, the player rather can say, okay, well, you know, maybe I shouldn't have gone this route. I'm going to somewhat retcon, you know, this, this, and this. And if the chronicler is good with it and it makes sense for the story, cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, the point is, is to, to collectively tell a story, not uh, necessarily, um, you know, um, try to be as uber as possible, but have a character that has uh, context and meaning within a larger tale. Mm-hmm. Um, that makes for, in my opinion, that makes for much better role play. Yeah. And uh, makes for much better uh, collective storytelling in general. Yeah. What you're describing isn't too far removed from the concept of session zero. But since we brought up talents, I want to. Um... I, fit, I want to fire off that particular Chekhov's gun while I have while I have the chance. Um, so, I have a, I have a complicated relationship when it comes to the nature of feats or their or their equivalent, largely because of my experiences with um, 3.5 and some of its equivalents. Because um, the idea of feats is some is something that I like. That uh, that notion of putting in an, a, an additional degree of personalization beyond just race, class, attributes, skills, the the basic um, setups. Mm-hmm. Um, however, when it was first introduced back in 2000 with um thir- with third edition's take of it, um, there were a lot there were a lot of traps, and there was a and there were a lot of Having, there was a lot of moments of having to pre-plan several sessions in advance how you're going to develop. Essentially, false choice. Right, um, yeah. You kind of I, think uh, out, okay, by the time I get to 20th, yeah. I want to be this guy, so to have this. Do you, remember the prerequisites then, for so. the, do you remember the prerequisites for the whirlwind feat back then? Oh, it was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it was like you had, three or four deep. <laughs> Yeah, you had you had to pl- you had to plan se- you had to plan way in advance just to make sure you qualified for everything. Mm-hmm. And the and um if if you want if, when it comes to doing that that ver, that very linear restricted approach so I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with that but when feats are supposed to be personal um personalization and then you have it that it ends up being that rigid it's not doing its job right now to point something out um in um say third edition D and D um you know you've got a feat depending on your class, every so many levels or whatever. Um, again, we're point-based, so you can buy a talent in For Front for Glory um, whenever. Mm-hmm. And you don't have to have any if you don't want. Uh, you can just leave it alone and put those points towards other things. Uh, the standard cost is five build points. Um, and unlike D&D, 3rd uh, edition D&D, where you had these, like, deep trees that just branched off to get to those uh, really, you know, really useful uh, feats in that system. Uh, Ours only go too deep at most. Uh, You might have one prereq uh, of a talent before you can take another talent. 
uh, but that's because they pair together. <laughs> um, so for instance, to take uh, press the advantage, um, which gives you a free attack, I want to say, scroll down here to it. Uh, but you have to have the ambush uh, uh, talent, um, which anybody who's played a rogue in D and D will, will readily recognize as, Oh, in this system, that's how I sneak attack. Mm -hmm. Um, but press the advantage. Let's see. Your character is learned in, in uh, that in combat. Survival outweighs any code of conduct or sense of honor. When an enemy character within uh, within your weapon reach is made prone or otherwise immobilized, gain an immediate attack against that character. Cool. Uh, but there's only the one prereq. Uh, ambush itself, the prerequisite talent, is not that... Yep, you have to have a perception skill of three or higher. Skills go um, zero to ten. Um, it's only going to cost you a handful of points to get perception skill. Mm -hmm. uh, so instead of making it all these prereqs, you know, stacked way deep and hard, um, we've left them very, very minimal um, on purpose. Um, but the point cost is what's really the 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 um, the cost to your character. Because uh, that's points you could be putting towards skills or attributes or, or uh, you know, you're, if you're a caster, your power, what have you. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we, we took kind of the same concept, but we made it much more streamlined. Mm -hmm. And um, again, it's a la carte, so you can buy none of them or you can buy a, a ton and get them, you know, working together in, in the right tactical situations. Yeah. Now, speaking on skills, mm -hmm. with I've I've um I've picked on D I picked on D and D quite a bit, so it's time for me to pick on Shadowrun. Um, and Shadowrun is not is not the only offender of this. There, a lot of the really crunchy games from the games from the nineties were nineties and eighty and eighties were also guilty of this. It's the reason why um the reason why I have joked that I will not run Phoenix Command again unless I'm paid. <laughs> but you look at a lot of those games, and they had lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of skills. Yeah. And only a fair and a comparatively small um, potential when it came to when it came to skill point allocation. Um, and especially given how narrow the use of each skill was going to was going to be, like, mm -hmm. what, like what, like having 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 indiv having individual um individual combat skills for every type of firearm. Yeah, yeah. With with little in the way of crossing over, because well, some somehow somebody who can be an absolute god with an assault rifle is is a complete gimp with a pistol. Which makes no sense. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've yet I've yet to see yet I've yet to see any kind I've yet to see any kind of soldier have that kind of training. Um, maybe 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 um maybe Russian conscripts, but even that even <laughs> then that's a bit of a stretch. But the uh, po the point is, the point is is that how do, how do you make how do you are you going with a with a relatively small with a relatively smaller um pool of skills. Yes, uh, there's 23 at last count, and that that, that will not expand, um, and that carries everything through um, animal empathy. You know, dealing with animals, uh, which is also the role you use for writing, incidentally. Um, mm -hmm. Your use of armor. So, uh, what in you know old school D and D or in, uh, third, fifth, whatever you know proficiencies. Um, the types of armor that you can use is dependent on your your skill in the armor skill. That's it. Um, as your armor skill goes up, not only do you get access to be able to proficiently use heavier and heavier armors, but also um, you get bonuses to your defense given by those armors and also um, how well you move in those armors. Because as we're, you know, anybody who's, who's uh, read any history about... Uh, you know, medieval knights, for instance, knows that they spent a whole lot of time training in that armor so they could move around and, and uh, be uh, a little bit more mobile on the battlefield. And it, you know, till it became like a second skin to them. <laughs> um, so we tried to model that with the armor skill. Um, athleticism is your, you know, swimming, jumping, climbing, 
et cetera. In terms of, uh, uh, oh, and five of those 23 are all the five uh, disciplines of magic. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're a non-magic user, you know, you're only looking at 18, um, and that includes, you know, profession, um, let's see, navigation, um, you know, some things that you may or may not want to use, depending on, you know, who your character is. Uh, in terms of weapon skills, there's three tiers. Uh, common weapons, which are uh, the kinds of weapons that um, are typically light, but not always, but they're the kind of weapons that a uh, peasant militia mm -hmm. would have uh, readily available. Uh, spears, um, a short bow, um, a sax, the, uh, the uh, you know, the Saxon and uh, Germanic knife, um, those kind of things, uh, clubs, uh, easy to master kind of weapons. Um, then we have uh, martial weapons, which are things like uh, the, the common military weapons. Um, that's going to be like your long swords, uh, the sort of things that you didn't see villagers carrying around. You'd, you'd uh, typically see uh, soldiers using uh, morning stars, for instance. Um, and then, of course, we have heavy weapons. And uh, heavy weapons are those things that, uh, those kinds of weapons that you'd only, usually large and unwieldy, but deadly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the kind of things that you usually wouldn't see a warrior on the battlefield during the Middle Ages using unless they were just like a bear of a dude. Um, your great axes, you know, your two handed swords, that sort of thing, um, fall under uh, heavy weapons primarily. Uh, with each of those three tiers of weapon skills, um, it, it, yes, gives you uh, having any level of skill in a given tier gives you um, some, it gives you proficiency over that group. But to get martial weapons, for instance, you need to have, I think it's two points. Yep, a minimum of two in um, common weapons. Uh, because uh, a squire's trained with, you know, simple things first, at least until they get to be like kind of that novice level. And then they're like, OK, now let's try a longsword. Um, and then the same for heavy weapons. You have to have at least a, a couple points in uh, martial weapons uh, to kind of move up the chain there. Uh, so you don't end up with fighters who um, are completely unskilled whatsoever mm -hmm. uh, with uh, a short sword. But they're awful keen with that battle axe, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it's it's a uh, for a warrior. It's kind of in the Middle Ages. That's kind of a, um, it's a it's a learning curve. You you move your way through the arsenal mm -hmm. as you learn how to use things proficiently. Yeah. Now speaking of that, I'd like to talk a bit about combat. Mm -hmm. We are we already touched on it when when establishing that characters are not exactly going to be squishy. But. Mm -hmm. What I am interested in go in going over is addressing addressing the one trick pony issue that that we kind of poked fun at earlier. The whole the whole thing of of martial characters doing just basic attack and nothing else. Right. Yeah. Um, how how do you address that? Well, here's the thing: is with the weapons themselves, um, I really hated how a lot of games boil down medieval weaponry into um, stats like a, a weapon size, a damage type, and a, uh, a give and die. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Um, each of these medieval weapons are, are a specific technology that was created in a specific technological context to counter another threat. Uh, when you look at uh, the, the material culture of uh, medieval weaponry. Um, mm -hmm. To that end, uh, we've worked really hard to give every piece of arms and armor their own um, kind of um, you know what the, uh, something they shine at um, for instance let's let's find a good one here let's go down into the martial weapons um, a flanged mace for instance um, I'm sure we're all familiar mm -hmm. with that one <laughs> classic oh, yeah. example um, on a successful hit where you do three or more stages of damage, uh, the weapon damages the shield or armor of the defender uh, by one point. So um, if they've got a shield, um, it you know you slam them hard with the the, the uh, flanged mace, and their shield is you know to say it's a medium shield, it's lost half its effectiveness. Uh, when a piece of equipment hits zero, 
uh, armor bonus, it's effectively done until it's repaired. Uh, it's no longer usable and uh, will actually slow you down unless you drop it. Mm -hmm. uh, no point in holding on to that shield that's been turned to splinters. Uh, now, all weapons will damage armor, uh, but you have to do at least five stages of damage, so a super heavy blow uh, to be able to, uh, to, to really damage them. Uh, armor damage, the shield always damages first because that's what a warrior is going to use you know, as their main defense. Um, and then moves on to their armor if once their shield is either uh, dropped or um, uh, destroyed. Mm -hmm. So, again, you know, shields are uh, shields are splintered, um, and armor is dented. But um, the same is true with uh, shields. For instance, each one of them have their own little quirk um, that defines them as a technology. Um, like for instance, um, the, uh, Aspis is a heavy, medium sized round shield made of a shallow bow shaped wooden structure reinforced with bronze, uh, favored by melee, melee infantry, uh, because of the cloth curtain affixed to the bottom of the shield, which is designed to catch arrows, mm -hmm. thus affording some limited defense to the warrior's lower legs without extending the dimensions of the shield. Mm -hmm. uh, when attacked with a ranged weapon, uh, the defender with an aspis is treated as if he has soft cover, uh, which gives you, a, of course, a, a bonus against uh, ranged attacks. Mm -hmm. um, so the point is, is, is how to, to avoid the one-trick pony thing um, is we've given a lot of attention in the combat system to uh, being able to uh, fight tactically, uh, to make it matter a little bit, whether you're fighting from high ground or horseback or... Mm -hmm. Uh, when, when it comes to making your attacks and if you know you say are walking around all the time with a um, uh, flanged mace but you find yourself fighting from horseback well you're not really gonna have against somebody in light armor you're not really going to have the effectiveness of that flanged mace you're not gonna be able to use that weapon's special property very effectively so at that point, it makes more sense to pull out your longsword, which gets a uh, bonus from back horseback, mm -hmm. um, if you follow what I'm saying. Um, this system really uh, encourages fighters to uh, kind of have a, a toolkit of weapons that um, really kind of speak to the tactical situations that they think they're going to be encountering. And it also gives them... Uh, that flexibility to be able to use those various things uh, fairly uh, uniformly. Uh, you can specialize your skill in a, a given weapon, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, why would you if uh, if it's fairly effective just to, uh, in, unless you're like maxed out on the skill, uh, unless you uh, just really, really love shooting that bow or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but again, you'll find yourself at a disadvantage sometimes compared to other characters who are, are fighting more tactically and using the right tool for the right situation. If you follow what I'm saying. Oh yeah. And with the, with that kind of with that kind of thing in mind, one of the more infamous issues in so, in some in some games is how they handle grappling and we and it's mm -hmm. I think it's I think it's been well established that um, one of the workaround one of the workarounds when it came to people fighting in armor was a bigger emphasis on well wrestling because because mm -hmm. because ob obviously it's a little obviously it's gonna be a little harder to move around when you're in when you're in that tin can right yeah um, people in heavy armor for instance will take a um, penalty when wrestling uh, because they're in that heavy armor again. If they're highly skilled with armor, that'll mitigate that penalty somewhat. Mm -hmm. uh, but the guy in you know medium or, or light armor or even no armor, who's got the strength to really you know manhandle that other guy, and uh, you know catches him <laughs> catches him with, without getting you know catching a weapon first, is going to have much more success in uh, wrestling somebody and. Uh, restraining them and and or doing damage uh, there is a talent that uh you know when you wrestle uh you don't typically do damage you can do stun points but uh, you do immobilize your opponent uh to pin them so to speak but uh there is a talent where you get a uh, an extra elbow or something you know to a to a head to a uh, uh 
you know, critical spot uh, on your opponent and can actually do a little bit of damage too. Did I address the yeah. question? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little coffee up. <laughs> no, wor no worries. I um, at the very least is a, at the very least is the coffee that I know that I know I didn't touch. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Not, um. Per, if I ever if I ever end up meeting you in Tennessee at a con, I I know to not give you not um offer to buy, offer to buy Starbucks or what or what have you, <laughs> because you'll end up th because you'll end up thinking I pulled something. <laughs> right. Oh. Um, <laughs> From that story earlier. Yeah. Uh, speaking of cons, um, at this point, that'd be a good point to uh, shout out that uh, at, here in Chattanooga, uh, Conduga, uh, which is February 20. Google it real quick. I'm horrible with dates. Uh, Conduga this year is February 18 to 20. Um, here in Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, in the gaming room, we will be doing a uh, promo event for Fraun and for Glory, uh, where we're going to have a uh, Knight's Tourney, mm -hmm. um, since we've been talking about combat system, yeah. um, in which uh, participants will have uh, a whole table full of, of different flavor and equipped knights of roughly the same um, uh, build point level and... and uh, you know, various uh, skill builds and, you know, talents and things. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have a joust. We're going to have a wrestling match. We're going to have um, a hand-to-hand, -hand, you know, one-on-one uh, -on -one melee and event and uh, possibly archery. Not sure. We'll see what time allows. But mm -hmm. uh, basically for each of those three events, we're going to do brackets and, uh, and at a big PvP event to find out who is the, um, you know, winner of the grand tourney. Mm-hmm. Uh, winners are going to receive a little bit of merch and uh, free copies of the books, and we'll have uh, some participation awards for other other folks who aren't so lucky. Yeah. And with the, that bring that um that brings me to one other avenue that is a road less traveled when it comes to medieval games. I'd say I'd say one of the standard bears of tra of traveling this particular road is of all things Pendragon, if you're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. And that, oh, slightly, and, and that is the that is the courtly manner. The because the the um the the approach of de of dealing with courtly affairs, dealing with the political intrigue. Oh, and, those and are some of my this, favorite games. <laughs> this style of things, and I have I have a soft spot for that kind of thing as a longtime fan of Legend of the Five Rings. Mm -hmm. And Scorpion Clan is best clan. <laughs> But I'm curious. I'm curious if I'm curious how you how you um, handle that kind of thing, and possibly how you'd handle social combat. Um, going back to the skill system, mm -hmm. uh, we have one skill that's just literally just social uh, for your you know your various uh, social skill um, as a character um, that covers you know lying, subterfuge, uh, that sort of thing. Um, that being said, we also have, uh, with the talents uh, or not talents, but the background traits and, uh, uh, flaw system that you can often define, uh, whether you're a courier, whether you're a noble, what your place in society is, whether you're an artisan, etc. Mm -hmm. Um, and it depends on the kind of story you're playing, but should you want to play that high intrigue, uh, kind of courtly story, um, it's there for you. Um, that coupled with the background traits coupled with your wealth and your social skill um, give you personal uh, kind of uh, social currency in your standing and how well you can maneuver court. Um, also, how you're perceived, your, your character is perceived is also going to, you know, of course, revolve around your wealth. Uh, wealth, in this case, isn't just... Um, uh, just sheer money resources, although that's one of the things he does give you. But during the Middle Ages, um, your general you know, level of wealth as a person wasn't defined by uh, just sheer gold, oftentimes, you know, coinage. But what what are your holdings? Um, who are your retainers? What, Who and what can you bring to bear? Uh, what is your place within uh, medieval society? Um, who's your liege? Um, and who do they answer to? Um, 
and all of these things are, are kind of wrapped up between uh, the background traits and the wealth system. Um, for instance, if you spend no points on wealth, it doesn't cost you any bill points, but your monthly income uh, from whatever you do, whether it's panhandling or whatever, is going to be restricted to three silver. Uh, you've only got 10 silver to start the game with. Um, you've got no staff and uh, you live in like a, a hut down by the river, <laughs> you know, uh, versus if you have ramped it up to five and uh, you've spent a, a considerable amount of build points on, on wealth. And uh, you may even be, a, you know, likely at that point or um, some sort of nobility or, or uh, higher merchant class. Uh, you're going to have a, a, a considerable monthly income. Uh, you're going to have up to a thousand people on your staff. And when I say staff, um, that's any sort of, of uh, NPC, whether it's, uh, you know, armsman, uh, butcher, baker, a candlestick maker. Um, when you get into that level of wealth, uh, there's a, a worksheet that you build uh, that essentially you, you detail who you have within your demands mm -hmm. um, that are, are your legion, like that they answer to you. Um, and of course, you're also going to have a, a ton of uh, starting money. But uh, along with that comes your domain. So in the, the wealth five category, which is, again, extremely costly in build points. But uh, at that point, you know, you've been given uh, by your liege lord or your king or, or whatever, a castle, a guild hall, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, a noble house, uh, you know, high house. Um, and all of those things together are going to kind of frame who you are and what your status is within society. And that's going to flavor a lot of how people treat you at court. If you wanted to play one of those, uh, you know, intriguey uh, games, mm -hmm. do we codify it and have an explicit system just for courtly intrigue? No, because I wanted to leave that up to um, a chronicler, how they want to shape their story. Mm -hmm. uh, we give you the tools to frame the context your character um, is in and, and who they are within society. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to kind of hedge people into a corner as to, as to um, what they're able to do. Um, somebody who's a very clever and kind of sneaky player might come up with a very clever idea. And if they have the resources to, to play it out in story and make that happen, cool, go for it. Uh, sounds like a good story to me. <laughs> yeah. And, well, you you probably you probably know about the Roman handshake, right? Roman handshake? Yeah. Do you tell? You shake with the left hand and you stab with the right. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, we've had some uh, some fun playing some kind of cloak and dagger games, and, and oddly enough, one of the the, the best ones we played was um, not even high Middle Ages, but was Viking Age, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we had a lot of people who were. Um, connected to the Jarl or given Jarl. Uh, we had Jarls vying amongst each other and uh, they were planning on, uh, you know, biting each other in the back and, and kind of some hostile takeover in uh, Denmark. At the same time, um, the, 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 the characters themselves and a lot of the, uh, their Jarls uh, uh, people were all engaged in sailing to Northumbria to, to attack York. Mm -hmm. Uh so it was fun to kind of play the, uh, the, the, the political back and forth and maneuvering and things amongst the raiding group uh, made up of, of uh, people from several different Jarldoms who each had their own agendas, um, both on the raid and back home, and kind of keep up with what's going on back home as information is, you know, ships came back and forth, they'd learn new things, um, you know, usually weeks after they'd happened, and they were kind of having to play politics on both fronts um meanwhile going to raid york <laughs> yeah and i've um i've taught i i'd like to i'd like to as a bit of a as a bit of a capstone since we talked earlier about how about how there about how fantasy is not a one-size-fits-all umbrella mm -hmm. um You've described you've described for honor and glory as a as a um, as a epic fantasy, an epic fantasy role playing system. What I'm curious about in that regard is what 
you define as epic fantasy? Because it's something that a lot of people have different takes on. Yeah, agreed. Um, and I chose that term because I wanted something that um, was epic in the the sense of like the uh, the Greek epics, you know, uh, that were stories where the fantastic happened, where um, it doesn't happen throughout the entire story, but you've got some really just like crazy groundbreaking, like you know, earth shattering kind of events that happen that you've got the the weird and unimaginable. Um, so I guess I chose the the term epic more from a literary sense than a role playing genre sense, mm -hmm. if that makes sense to you. Um, and I wanted to again put uh, in that way, kind of put the emphasis on uh, collective storytelling, um, because I mean, you know, no matter what game system you're running uh, or what what flavor of game you're playing, uh, we all know that that the best laid plans end up falling apart. Um, and, you know, in all the various games that I've, I've run, cause I'm usually the guy who runs them. Mm -hmm. Um, I often find that it's better not to try to pre-write and railroad your players into, to a given plot, but mm -hmm. let them kind of guide events. All you do is you give them a situation, a context, uh, where there's, you know, um, uh, certain powers at play. Uh, politically, economically, uh, culturally, uh, you give them the backdrop and kind of the nudge out the door towards uh, towards greatness, and you you let them find it. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is something that I've said in the the Chronicler's Guide uh, that that's your job as a chronicler is to not you know cajole and pigeonhole uh, the the plot into a, a linear story or, or even uh, general trajectory but let it grow organically mm -hmm. as your players decide how they want to interact with, with uh, moral and ethical situations. Um, your job as a chronicler is to, to provide um, setting to give everything flavor to, um, to basically give them the framework to do that. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, I can, I can see that. Now, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? for the project the entire project uh both core rule books uh for fraud and for glory will be out at the end of february uh so by march 1st it should be hitting um uh, digital sales um our chronicler's guide came back for copyright that's in hand uh so it's it's good to go i really want to put both books out together uh because they do go hand in hand um and chronicler's guide is nearly done i'm, I'm uh about to, to pull the trigger on it and send it out to the world um, for, for copyright and all else. So that being said, it's it's right on track to uh, uh, go out for that that uh, you know end of February launch date uh, at the very latest March first. Uh, I've, I've kind of promised our Kickstarter contributors that's yeah. <laughs> that's when they'll see it is uh, by the end of February, mm -hmm. and uh, that's going well. And so. Uh, I want to be sure to live up to that regard, or you know that, that promise. You should have um, said it for March fourth. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, that would have been great. Um, you know, you'd mentioned a lot of uh, kind of Greco-Roman themes and uh, your love of wrestling and and uh, you know, that kind of character. And uh, I'd mentioned the Age of Sales, the first expansion that's going to be yeah. coming out, um, that has a later period stuff than, than the the core rule books. Um, in, you know, including like, uh, you know, sloops and, you know, naval cannon and, uh, you know, rifled muskets, pretty much everything technologically um, moving up to the very, very be uh, beginning of the uh, Industrial Revolution mm -hmm. in one expansion book. But the next one that I haven't uh, announced until I guess now um, is going to be the Age of Antiquity, which is going to take us back to the Greco-Roman world. It's going to be very much more kind of... Uh, a sword and sorcery feel um, your, your limit as to the power mortals can wield magically is going to be uh, stepped up just like it stepped down a bit in um, the age of sales. Uh, that'll be the reverse for age of antiquity. Um, a lot of those classical monsters from the Greco Roman world, uh, the monsters and beasts and things will be uh, released there. Um, you know, everything from you know, Medusa to Echidna and uh, everything in between. Uh, the Cyclops and and uh, some of those kind of explicitly classical 
uh, monsters that didn't you know quite hang around into uh, looming large in the medieval mines uh, like others did. Yeah. Uh, and I go do ahead. Wa- I do want to. I do want to put a, put a bit of clarification. My uh, my interest in whether it be Age of Stale or 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 Greco Roman is more of, is more for reflection of the fact that I don't. I resent the idea that fantasy has to be British Isles. Yeah. I call it the Tol- I call it the Tolkien melting pot. <laughs> um, I rem I remember I remember I remember reading old forums and people complaining that Planescape Planescape of all things was too weird to be considered fantasy. What? No. Yeah, I remember people saying this un- unironically when it came to Planescape, and I saw the same thing with one of the weirder um, uh, Morrowind expansions. And it's it speaks to that issue of, pe- of people having this idea that that to- that um, that pastiche of of Tolkien esque elements, even though a lot of people end up missing the point. Is how you're supposed to do fantasy, and I especially saw pushback when, it, when in the early 2000s I was starting to introduce elements of um, manga into my campaigns, and I got and I got I got my I got some crap for that. <laughs> but <laughs> how dare you step over uh, uh, the predefined genre lines, preconceived well, okay. genre lines? Look, I, I don't I don't step over lines I don't step over lines I piss on them. Right, <laughs> I piss on them and then I and then I light and then I light them on fire. You know, some bridge over the ridge river Kwai shit. But I remember, um, I remember someone doing a thought experiment of what if Gygax and Arneson were inspired more by Greco-Roman myth, and that prompted the game uh, Mazes and Minotaurs, mm-hmm. um, which is I think still available for free. But I j- but. I've always I've always been of the I've always been of the mindset of expo- of exploring other possibilities besides 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 British Isles. I think the mm-hmm. reason why The Witcher ended up being being as popular as it is is because the of the fact that it's aiming far more for um, Slavic. Yeah, um, I think that's they pull also things the, from um, Portugal. Um, I mean, that's Poland. where the Bruxa comes from. Poland, yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of folk metal, and a lot of that it comes from. Various places in Scandinavia, mm-hmm. um, and I'm a quarter Danish, so I love that stuff. <laughs> yeah, I um, and I've, but since I mentioned L5R, obvi- obviously I'm a big I'm a big fan of um, of sa- of samurai th- of samurai or Chanbara theater. Mm-hmm. Um, I've me- I've mentioned wrestling, so you know, so that goes that goes for that goes for every style you can think of. Include, including some of the insanity that happens in Japan or in Mexico. <laughs> um, <laughs> and but, um, but you know, just, I'm a North American archaeologist. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I originally, in college, uh, as an undergrad, uh, was uh, in Mesoamerican. Mm-hmm. Um, I love this stuff, and I, I have a fascination with the, the not just the, you know, the prehistoric Native America uh, mm-hmm. or Americas, but um, also with uh, you know contact period and and the the clash of cultures that happens uh, mm-hmm. through the colonial period. And uh, that gets kind of to like what we're storyboard- storyboarding for the future of the game. Uh, and that's a, a, an East expansion uh, mm-hmm. focusing on, on uh, uh, you know, most of Asia, <laughs> um, everything from, uh, you know, everything East of the, the Rus, basically. Um, there is a lot of, in the base core rule books, there's a lot of uh, Arabic, there's a lot of uh, Spanish, um, a lot of Scandinavian influences. Um, I've kind of taken a, uh, a, a kind of a broader approach to um, what fantasy can be just in the core rule books as they're about to be published. Um, Slavic monsters um, and, and uh, legends um, and incorporated a lot of that to try to give as much cultural flavor as possible mm-hmm. uh, when dealing with kind of this, this European setting. Um, Northern Africa, too, uh, for that matter. Um, the age of antiquity is going to focus more on that, that classic, uh, you know, everything from, you know, uh, somewhere back in the roots of say, you know, Assyria, um, mm-hmm. Babylonia through, um, the Roman empire 
and then the expansion of the empire up into you know the British Isles and then collapse. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a huge chunk. <laughs> uh, but I want to try to give as much treatment of all that material as possible there. Uh, the Age of Sails, although it's going to be a late period expansion, it's going to focus a lot more on um, the Americas mm-hmm. and uh, South America included. Um, so some native weaponry uh, from the Aztecs, for instance, we got a Makuyutl, mm-hmm. the, uh, I lo- the famed I always uh, love Aztec War Club. Those. Yeah, I love those things. Yeah, those are so cool. Uh, And these are things that should be in a fantasy game, especially if we're going to, you know, talk, have an expansion that's the class of these cultures, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we we tend to make colonial history all about uh, the the colonizers and and forget about uh, in in history and forget about uh, the the natives and kind of downplay what they'd already done and their roles and things. And I want to create a role playing game that reverses that historical trend and really gives more than just lip service um, to those cultures. Um, and then in future expansions, I mentioned the East, um, the Americas. Uh, we're going to have a, a book that's just the Americas, um, aside from Age of Sales. And then uh, from there, we're kind of toying with the idea of, of keeping the um, – the the same dice system and everything uh so the game will play ostensibly the same way but do a a modern setting expansion that uh kind of takes us kind of into a like an age of superheroes kind of thing um in the modern day you know like everything from say um world war one to now Mm -hmm. uh the age of sales will cover everything up to civil war so i mean you could even play a civil war game if you wanted uh, there could be some interesting stories there that, that pose a lot of uh, moral and ethical uh, quandaries for players. Um, but there's crazy things in history that happened then, too, mm-hmm. especially uh, in terms of what's going on with, uh, you know, earlier in the century, what's, what's going on with uh, Native American culture. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of room for, for uh, kind of different flavors of creative fantasy that uh, in different settings and periods than just that, that British Isles kind of narrow focus that you're, you were describing. And uh, I'm excited to see it develop. Uh, we've been working hard on the, the expansions as we finish up the core books. And uh, I'm just uh, keeping my fingers crossed that uh, people pick up the core game because uh, it's, we've never had a player walk away from the table dissatisfied. Everybody who sat down, even if they're not history buffs um, or, you know, hardcore gamers uh, people who've had noobs come and play if somebody who's never played a role-playing game before and once they kind of understood what was going on mm-hmm. um i mean it wasn't the second session we you know before they're um really into it and and saying you know sending me uh direct messages and things going, hey, hey orion you know uh do you know where i could look online to find out about this or that or the other thing and, and like people start doing historical research <laughs> which is just like for me as a historian that's like beyond the kin like wow it's you're not really into history and suddenly like you're all about it because you're a living part of it in yeah. a sense i already mentioned the one i already mentioned the the aztec war club that i, that I have that i'm fond of the other i should know the other historical weapon that i've that i've that i've had a soft spot for is the kopesh oh yeah those are sweet <laughs> <laughs> um the kopesh if my tri- my trinity of wi- of weird historical weapons is is the Mah- Mahakuitl, I can never get the pronunciation right, no matter how many yeah, times I, can't I try. Either. <laughs> um, the Kopesh and the Tayaha. Tayaha, I'm not familiar with that one. Um, the Tayaha is a, is a is a interest is an interesting take on a on a spear like weapon um, that was that was you that was used in poly- in um, Polynesian cultures, ah, um, the the it's I'd say it's about the size of a short spear. Um, mm-hmm. It's usually tipped with say j- with say jade or something pointy, but the other end of the thing is flattened. Like the the other e- the other end of the spear handle is is flattened. And it's usually a bit thicker than normal spears, so you can f- you can flip the thing on the other side, and now you've got a club. Ah, well, you know what? I just, uh, that's what I'm unfamiliar with. So mm-hmm. I just penciled that into the notes to look into. Yeah. Um, because, 
because of the because of the fact that I'm always looking to take take from it take from as many different ideas and as many different cultures as as possible for ideas you know the whole the whole thing of ste of if you steal from one person it's plagiarism if you steal from many people it's research <laughs> right uh, and that that's why I had joked that that's why I joked about the whole spending way too much time in books <laughs> but <laughs> I certainly look forward to seeing to seeing how it's going to um, develop, and anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to further go into um, talks of talks of adapting history into gaming, or j or just to laugh at the bard dying for the umpteenth time, <laughs> hide behind the pile of dead bards. <laughs> uh, the door is always open, as I often say around here. Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, I've got my horn ready, so. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>